The really crucial moment is the next moment after you've been gone, after you've been lost, because that's the moment we are practicing resilience. We have the chance to let go more gracefully of whatever the distraction has been and start over, begin again with like a full heart. From the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City, you're listening to Road to Resilience. I'm John Earl. Today on the podcast, we have Sharon Salzberg. She's a legendary meditation teacher. She was one of the first people to bring mindfulness meditation to the West in the 1970s. She's a best-selling author. She's the host of her own podcast, The Meta Hour. Sharon is also the co-creator of a series called Care for Caregivers, which features meditation techniques and bodywork techniques for caregivers. No matter how much meditation you've done, if it's zero or if you're a daily meditator, you're going to find something interesting and maybe powerful in what Sharon has to say. So here is Sharon Salzberg. I hope you enjoy it. Sharon Salzberg, welcome to Road to Resilience. Thank you so much. I want to come to this from a point of view of exhaustion. That might be an unusual place to come to it. And here's what well, I mean. Well, unusual only in, it, it seems to be the current mode, so I don't think it's, it's unusual in that sense. Here's what I mean. Mindfulness has so entered, like, the popular culture that I think a fair number of people are going to see mindfulness something, something, something in their podcast feed, and they're going to go, no, not, no, <laughs> enough, enough with the mindfulness. I don't want to <laughs> meditate. No, I don't want to be mindful. Like, enough, I can't take it anymore. And so I want to start by asking you how you approach that as a teacher. <laughs> well, I've been teaching for a very long time. I actually just had an anniversary as a, a practitioner. I began meditating January 7th, 1971. Congratulations. So I just had a 50th anniversary, wow. which is like such an outrageous thing to say. You how know, did you like, celebrate? I sat around, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, our times. It's like, it's not that easy. Uh, but... It, it it meant something, you know, like just to realize, as friends of mine say, oh, you were meditating before it's cool. And now, as you say, it's kind of not cool again. <laughs> but I think part of what the resistance is, is, is a little bit of a sense of coercion. Like, you've got to do this. You yeah, know? this like, is the thing to do now. Yeah, it's a thing to do. Or last year it was a thing to do. You're, always, you're like, you're almost past it, you know. Um but it's really not that way, you know. It, it uh, obviously, you know, this is a very difficult time for everybody. And uh, if you're working, you're in some way working on the front lines of suffering, wherever you are, you know, whether it's the hospital system or a grocery store, you know. Uh, and there is uh, the other side of people isolated and, and feeling very alone and. I do, you know, when I'm teaching like on Zoom, I read those chats and and I see the word exhaustion more than anything, which is why I made that comment. It's like, this has gone on for a long time, you know, I'm exhausted and I've, I've depleted my resources, my sense of inner resource. And I think mindfulness from meditation, it's a very uh, direct way of addressing that if you want to. And it's also a way that, you know, you don't need equipment, you don't need to being a group, uh, all those things that may not be available to us right now, it's, it's very private in a way, and that's good. I want to drill down into what mindfulness is and what it isn't, and I think that'll be helpful for people who are coming to this without any experience in mindfulness. How would you describe the is and isn't? Uh, I really do see mindfulness as a kind of skills training. It's like tools. And um, first of all, it it's cultivating a greater ability to be centered. And in the midst of the maelstrom of thoughts and feelings and impressions and experiences and stress, to have a place where we can actually rest our attention, uh, which doesn't dismiss all the other stuff, but we get some space from it. And, and that is, of course, crucial. And part of that sense of centering is a sense of rest. It's like if you're placing your attention on something, let's say the feeling of the breath, which would be a common mindfulness um, illustration. You're not trying to change the breath. You're not trying to improve it. You're just resting. And that's a rare thing, you know, in these days for us and any days for us. And it's restorative. You know, it gives us a sense of even momentary 
kind of peace, and that's important. Um, and then mindfulness, very importantly, is an ability to be with the whole range of feelings that come up for us in a different way. So we're not necessarily sucked into something and overcome by it, but we're also not pushing it away or ashamed of what we're feeling or freaking out. It's like, now that I've had that anniversary, I have the opportunity of saying to myself, you've been meditating for 50 years. Why are you still feeling that? You know, which I refrain from to the best of my ability. You know, so again, uh, part of what is important is that it's a recognition that we feel what we feel. We're angry. We're grieving. We're, we feel exhausted, whatever it is. And not to disparage that, but to learn a different relationship to it. Because we don't necessarily, of course, want to be overcome by those feelings and overtaken by them uh, so that our decisions are based on that or our choices, our actions are based on that. But we also don't want to fight what we're feeling and have a kind of hostility and fear or dislike. And so we, sometimes we call mindfulness a place in the middle. And that, again, it opens up the sense of space. So here's my favorite definition of mindfulness actually came from an article in the New York Times some years ago which was a pilot program bringing mindfulness into the classroom. Now it's you know, much more prevalent, but, but then it was, it was very new. So this is a fourth grade classroom in Oakland, California. So the journalist says to one of the kids, who let's say is probably nine or 10 years old in fourth grade, he says, what is mindfulness? What is mindfulness? And the kid responds by saying, Mindfulness means not hitting someone in the mouth. That's what mindfulness means. And I thought that is a perfect definition of mindfulness. Because what does it imply? It implies you know you're feeling angry when you're starting to feel angry, not after you've sent the email, you know, not after you've lashed out at somebody. And it also implies a certain balanced relationship to that anger. Because if we get consumed by these different feelings that come and go, we're likely to hit a lot of people in the mouth because life can be really frustrating. But at the same time, if we freak out about what we're feeling and we can't stand it and we're so embarrassed and we get tighter and tighter and tighter till we explode. So it doesn't work. So we say mindfulness is that place in the middle where you can recognize fully what's happening, but there's some space. And in that space, there's choice. There are options that we might not have otherwise seen. Uh, there's creativity. Like I like to think of that kid thinking, Hit someone in the mouth last week. Didn't work out that well. <laughs> Let me try this. So mindfulness is not like a passive state where you get all kind of gooey and, you know, you're just letting everything come and go in that sense. But the actions we take can be different. And as you said, even as someone who's been practicing for 50 years, you still come up against, you still have thoughts and feelings that are like, no, I don't. Those are those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. I, you don't become some, some kind of like serene, peaceful... Uh, although you're very peaceful, Sharon. You're Thank very... you. <laughs> but I think that's an important point to make, that the, the evolution is not that you become perfect inside somehow. It's that you, there's space between your thoughts and feelings and your actions. And there's, there's calm in that space and there's freedom in that space. That's exactly right. There is calm. I mean, you know, I went to India when I was 18 years old to learn how to meditate. There's a big difference. <laughs> but uh, it's because of the relationship shifting, not demanding that I never feel this again or I never feel that again, you know, which doesn't work for anybody. But um, there's a big difference between having a thought, seeing it for what it is, like old pattern, or maybe an assumption we need to question. You know, not all assumptions are incorrect, of course, but many of them are. And so, you know, there's just a lot of options in that space compared to being driven by our thoughts, taking it to heart, building a self-image around something, thinking it's the only thing I'll ever feel, or, and I think this is very important in this time, thinking I am the only one who's feeling this. We often add a sense of isolation to what may be a very difficult feeling, um, but we're never actually the only one. Mm. I think the caregivers who are listening to this will very much relate to a lot of what you've just said, in addition to not to sometimes feeling like the only one. Um, certainly the incredible highs and lows 
of the pandemic, of caring for people, of losing patients, of the camaraderie, of being on the front lines. Connect mindfulness to caregiving for me. Where does where can mindfulness come into that equation and maybe help someone who's in, in a caregiving role? That's a very important question for me. You know, some of the most profound work that I've done in the last many years has been for what we call caregivers. I often think we need maybe a better word because it doesn't necessarily evoke the power of being on the front lines of suffering. Uh, you whether have another word in mind? I don't, you know, and I struggle <laughs> with that. So if, I was going to ask you if you had another word in mind. <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, or I'll get back to you because I, I do think about it. Um, whether it's in your personal life or in your professional life. Um, and maybe it's, it's best exemplified by a distinction we sometimes make, um, which is also being made in, in research to some extent, between the word empathy and the word compassion or the state of empathy in the word compassion, which, of course, we use in common language as synonymous, but is actually a distinction sometimes drawn. So empathy is that felt sense of, it's like a resonance. You know, there is, of course, cognitive empathy as well, but uh, really we're talking about that kind of vibratory resonance with someone's situation. It's like sort we of feel we're into on the it. same wavelength. Thing. Yeah, we feel into it. Not in an imposing way, like I know exactly what you're going through, but there's something in us that um recognizes yeah. the like aloneness. I see pain or, and I yeah, feel that's right. Maybe something like that pain. Yeah, exactly. And that's essential, you know. Uh we see also in this world a lot of instances where there's not enough empathy and we see how cold and cruel it can be. Um, but we would say that's like an essential, it's a necessary but not sufficient building block for what we call compassion. So uh, compassion in this sense, we are defining as a movement toward some situation of, of pain to see if we can be of help. So that's distinguished from moving into to burn up ourselves or mm-hmm. moving toward to insist that we will be of help. So and let me make sure I understand. It. So the, the empathy is I feel it. The compassion is I'm moving towards. That's right. To see if I can help. Yeah. Yeah. So I see it in a very much in a sequential way. Like maybe we feel that sense of empathy and hopefully we do. But we're frightened by what we are encountering. So we just want to run away. Or we are exhausted. We feel depleted. We do not have the sense of wherewithal to meet it. And we all know that even – not in such extreme situations as now, just like you're done in and somebody starts telling you their very sad story and you're thinking, please go away. (laughs) You know, I cannot take it in. I just can't do it. Um, You know, so maybe you're frightened. Maybe you're exhausted. I've uh, also encountered... It's a horrible feeling. It's terrible. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's a horrible feeling when you you want to be there and you want to empathize and you can't be and you feel like such a bad person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, another terrible feeling, I I, uh, met a psychotherapist once who told me, this was just a cycle he got into, he said he found himself blaming a lot of his patients, like they would tell him some story and he'd think, I told you six months ago what to do, you know, if you'd only done it, you would be in a better way. Or we might have that kind of savior mentality, which also doesn't work, like I'm in control. I'm going to fix it. It's my responsibility to fix absolutely everything in this universe. Or we might have the compassionate response, which is moving toward, not into, but toward, to see if we can be of help. And so that implies balance. Maybe it's a balance between compassion for others and compassion for oneself. It implies an acknowledgement of limits, I will do everything I can, and I'm not in control of the universe. There's so much that's not in my hands, and that's not blameworthy. That's just reality. Um, It implies a a kind of wisdom that sometimes what we do is, is just like planting a seed. You know, I would imagine in a healthcare setting, you know, you can't be thinking about life and death as winning and losing, you know, there's a whole ecosystem there. Maybe there's the family, and now the, there's the family that's distant, or there's, you know, the, there's so many aspects where we we might be called on to do the best we can. And 
And we may not get like a rush of instant gratification. And that in no way means we did nothing. You know, that so often we are planting a seed and it will bear fruit in someone's recollection of that time, you know, or something like that. And, and so um, that's where mindfulness plays a role. We understand when we are exceeding that sense of limitation. We understand when we're burning out. It's like I've done a fair amount of work uh, through the, the Contemplative Based Resilience Program at the Garrison Institute with international humanitarian aid workers like people who are working in the refugee camps in Syria or something like that. And they've told me that when they start burning out, like the first sign is that they don't pay as much attention to safety protocols anymore. Wow, and that informs them, like, I, I think I'm in trouble. You know, and I can imagine it. You know, I, I don't know exactly how, you know, I mean, I, I think I think of myself as a layperson, not in a healthcare setting, you know. And I think I don't really feel like going through two renditions of "Happy Birthday" when I wash my hands, you know. It's like <laughs> I think mean, one is enough, for God's sake, you know. And it's just like oh, I'm not dealing, you know. Yeah. And that's a yeah. sign. And so there are many ways we can use mindfulness, just awareness of what we're feeling, recognition when we don't have a, a reasonable sense of boundaries, um, and I would say that sense of balance between compassion for ourselves and compassion for others is so crucial and it feels so wrong to us, especially if you are a helper, you know, your caregiver feels selfish and like weird and what do you mean? I'm, I need to rest or... <laughs> and you're surrounded by people who are giving everything. Yeah. Everything to their patients. And you might feel, well, like, why should I spend an hour on myself yeah. when I can save another life? Exactly. And, and the thing is, I mean, you have to look at the reality of the situation. I think it's it's not that likely you will save another life if you're, like, miserably, you know, overcome. <laughs> and you're just like, uh, you just don't have it in you. So it sounds like mindfulness creates the structure within which you can engage in a healthy way with suffering. Yeah, and I think even simp what seem like simple things are crucial. Like the first meditation instruction I ever had in India, beginning January 7th, 1971, was sit down and feel your breath. Just feel the sensations of the, the normal, natural breath. And as I often say, my first thought was, that's stupid. You know, like I came all the way to India. Like where's the magical, esoteric fantastic technique that's going to wipe out all my suffering and make me a totally happy person. And then I thought, eh, how hard can this be, you know? Like, what will it be, like 800 breaths or 900 <laughs> breaths before my mind starts to wander? And to my complete astonishment, it was like one breath, and I'd be gone. And I completely freaked out, you know? I was like, what's this? Um, and I heard, although I did not believe right away, over and over again, the instruction that would say, don't worry about that. That's just the way our minds are conditioned. The really crucial moment is the next moment after you've been gone, after you've been lost, because that's the moment we are practicing resilience. We have the chance to let go more gracefully of whatever the distraction has been and start over, begin again with like a full heart and not, you know, freak out and call yourself a failure and do all this stuff. And I thought maybe that's the first thing I really learned in meditation. It's probably the most important life lesson because how many times a day do we have to do a course correction or we have to shift something or we have fallen down in some way. We have to pick ourselves up or let others help us up. And we start over. We're always beginning again. And so even just like training that muscle, saying, okay, what's the best way to move on, to make progress. Is it, I mean, obviously, you know, we make a mistake, there have to be lessons learned, or maybe we have to make amends or whatever. So it's not trying to deny that, but that sort of endless castigating of ourselves and, you know, declaring that we're failures and we, you know, I mean, it doesn't help. It, it's actually, if we have the awareness and the spaciousness enough to look at it critically, we think, well, that was an hour and a half that was totally exhausting and demoralizing. 
you know, what good did that do? And and we understand the importance of being able to begin again. So it's even like tools like that that have helped me a lot. So you've mentioned breath work and in the caring for caregivers, excuse me, in the care for caregivers series, you do a couple of meditations called loving kindness meditations. I was wondering if you could explain what that is specifically and why did you choose that particular practice for this series? In some ways, stylistically, it's similar to the breath in that we have an object of awareness. We rest our attention on that object. Our minds wander and we let go more gracefully, hopefully always, and then and then keep coming back and starting over. But instead of resting our attention on the feeling of the breath in loving-kindness meditation, we rest our attention on the silent repetition of certain phrases. So the phrases are expressions of generosity of the spirit. It's like gift-giving. May you be happy. May you be safe. Things like that. And so it's a way of, first of all, channeling our energy and our mental energy. You know, if you, if you feel just like a barrage of thinking and, and you feel restless and, and agitated, it's a way of gathering all of that energy and moving it in a positive direction. It's also a way of uh, stepping out of what may be a more familiar rut. So, for example, if you think about yourself at the end of the day, almost to do a kind of evaluation And if you are in the habit of pretty well only remembering the mistakes you made and the things you didn't do quite right and where you didn't show up, let's just say, so much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you'll ever be just collapses into that, you know, stupid thing you said at lunchtime in the meeting. If we offer ourselves loving kindness, it's like saying, okay, maybe all that's true, but that's not all that I am. That's not all that happened today. So let me wish myself well. May I be safe, be happy. And because it's phrased that way, people often say to me, well, who am I asking? Well, I'm not asking anybody anything. It's like gift giving. You know, you hand someone a birthday card and you say, may you have a great year. May you be happy. May I be happy. Um, so you're shifting from just that endless sort of disparagement of yourself to wishing yourself well. Or uh, there are many people we encounter, we tend to look through instead of look at, you know, we objectify in some way. And uh, the grocery store clerk would be a perfect example of somebody who now, you know, of course, we call them essential workers. And hopefully we, we do a kind of reflection like, how do I get to eat? You know, if I'm not growing my own food, that we actually live in an interdependent universe. And I've had heads of medical practices say things to me like, you know who I'm more and more appreciative of in the hospital is the cleaning staff. And I think, well, yeah, you know. And so we also have a, a practice of offering loving kindness to those people. And we may not know anything about them. You know, the people we encounter that uh, we don't have a particular relationship with. Uh, that we don't maybe know anything about, even their name. But here, too, we we think of them and we think, may you be happy, may you be... What does doing that lead to? Well, it leads to, um, most profoundly, a recognition of connection, that our lives have something to do with one another, and a way of being with, so that there's a sense of we that is very real. So... Uh, that that idea of interdependence can seem very abstract, but like whenever I was going into a company or an organization to teach, my favorite question was, who else has to be doing their job well for you to do your job well? You know, because in fact, that's the reality of things. And so uh, the more we pay attention differently, the more we, we recognize that. It doesn't mean we like everybody. It doesn't even mean we like anybody, but... But there's a deep knowing that our lives have something to do with one another. And so the feelings, I mean, right now is just an exacerbation of the kind of loneliness people have been reporting anyway. And even if you're working in the world, you know, it, you can feel very disconnected within. And so the more we can connect 
to kind of a greater sense of humanity, the more uh, we can recognize that as well, that it's it's never just me. Mm. And you can approach that with compassion for yourself, which of course will lead to compassion for others. Let's talk about practices. In the popular imagination, meditators sit with cross legs for long periods of time doing something, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be that way. We have a lot of options, actually. Um, you can sit, and I find that a very useful thing to do. That's like a little period of, str- of um, strength training. So in a way, we can, divide, we can divide the meditative process into two parts. One is a dedicated period where we're just sitting or walking or lying down, whatever the posture, and we're just cultivating awareness and compassion. The other part is what we call sometimes short moments many times, where probably a classic example of that comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, this uh, Vietnamese teacher who said, don't pick up your phone on the first ring. Let it ring three times and breathe. Then you pick it up. You know, nothing that's very lengthy, but just this interjection of short moments. And I once went into a finance company in New York to teach. And I said that, and I looked up, and I saw the complete panic on everyone's faces. And so I said, well, maybe for you just twice. Just let it ring twice. You know, where you try to drink a cup of tea or coffee, and you're not multitasking for once. You're really feeling the warmth of the teacup, and you're smelling the tea, and you're tasting the tea. So short moments many times. But I find that those are hard to remember and much easier to remember if I've also meditated in a formal sense each day. So the That's length helpful. of... helpful. That connects the, the mindfulness to the meditation. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. You know, so it is. It's like this little period of strength training. And then you've got, you've got a greater ability. So the last neuroscientist I talked to about the length of meditation. And remember, uh, as a neuroscientist, they're talking about demonstrable changes in the brain that can be shown on an fMRI machine was 12 minutes a day, uh, three to five times a week. I just had that conversation with somebody, actually. And for me, just as an individual, every day is easier for me than three to five times a week. Because for me... If we were three to five times a week, it would be Monday, and I think, I'll start on Wednesday. And it's Wednesday, I think, I'll sit five times on Saturday. You know, but if it's every day, it's every day. But that, you know, you just learn from your own rhythm and your own patterns. And What does your practice look like uh, after 50 years? After 50 years, yeah. Um, I do a lot of that short moments many times, and especially now, like I'm not traveling and other things, and I sit usually twice a day these days and 20 to 40 minutes at a time. Really, 12 minutes can do it. I mean, I some people say five minutes, and I do believe if you've only got five minutes, do five minutes. It's like the regularity of it that seems the most important. But sometimes the first five minutes are the hardest five minutes, you know, because you sit, you sit down and you think, I forgot to call someone, someone, I've got to do this, I want to set sound, I think it's my refrigerator. Do we still have repair people for refrigerators? I don't know. I don't even think we have Sears anymore. How am I going to get in the refrigerator? But that will settle down. Yeah. And, you know, you'll get much more space from that. But really five minutes would be beneficial. And some people say three minutes. But since I just had that conversation with a neuroscientist, you know, I'll stake a claim for 12. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. People talk about the spillover from, from the formal meditation practice to the mindfulness throughout the day. The spillover effect for me, I felt most profoundly in in the distance between my thoughts and feelings and emotions, whether it is to get angry or to, you know, satisfy a, a desire or a compulsion, being able to see that happen. And then, you know, as we were talking about at the very beginning, be like, no, 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 no. Just wait. Wait for the second ring. Right? Do I want to do that? Yeah, that's right. It's pretty profound. Yeah, I think it's very profound. And um... You know, that gap between what we're feeling and how we're acting is very, very important because we feel what we feel. You know, we cannot control our feelings, but actions are consequential. And so um, having some space is is really the most precious thing. It's it's really an extraordinary thing. What I've noticed for myself these days um, is that 
because I have more time. You know, I'm not traveling. I'm not arranging travel. I'm not doing all those things. And because I'm practicing short moments many times quite diligently. I think a lot about email. And it's funny because I, I have a, a resolve to be kinder in emails. Like I was never mean as far as I know, but... You know, it's just like rereading things before I press send and thinking, well, you know what, I'll take out that sentence. They don't actually really need to hear that or that's going to have them wondering, you know, what does she mean? And then it's going to be maybe not so helpful or, or something like that. And I think it's wonderful feeling that your whole life can feel like a creative medium. So, Sharon, I'm wondering what you would say to a beginner, somebody who's maybe dabbled in meditation, who's read a little bit about it, but is having trouble actually getting started? Uh, well, I think one of the best things is to read a little bit more about it, you know, and uh, or to have some kind of community or, if possible, a teacher, which could be through an app or anything, you know. It doesn't have to be in person, which it wouldn't be right now anyway, because so much of the time we bring our ideas of what should be happening right into the process, and then we suffer needlessly. Like, so many people if I'm introduced as a meditation teacher, will say to me, oh, I tried that once, I failed at it. We don't believe you can ever fail at it because the point isn't what you're experiencing, but how you're relating to what you're experiencing. So if I say to somebody, why do you think you failed at it? They'd say, well, I couldn't stop my thoughts. I couldn't have a perfectly blank mind. I couldn't keep anxiety from arising. I couldn't keep sleepiness at bay. But we don't think that that's the point of meditation anyway. It's changing our relationship to our thoughts, our relationship to the anxiety, our relationship to the sleepiness. And that's so hard to believe, you know. And so creating a kind of supportive context where you either keep reminding yourself or you have reminders. It's okay. Whatever I'm experiencing is okay. And I'm the kind of person who's very supported by structure. That's why every day is good for me. You know, and I usually ask people, set a realistic goal. Like, what is realistic for you? And people will say, like, 10 minutes a day for a month or 10 minutes a day for a week, whatever it is. And then do that. You know, so it has to be not eight hours a day because it's not going to happen. But, you know, something really reasonable. And don't worry about what you're experiencing during the course of the practice because it will always change. The reason we meditate is not to become a great meditator. The reason we meditate is to see the effects in our lives. And so that's the place to look. You know, people say, wow, you know, I, th I sat and I th was diligent and I thought nothing was happening, but then I noticed, you know, like I got really weirded out at this work situation, but it didn't last all day the way it usually does. You know, it, it lasted for 20 minutes, and that's a big change. You know, that's where we really see the difference. And so uh, it's good to assess, it's good to evaluate, it's good to see if you want to continue, but look at the right place, which is your life. So another way to get started in the caregiver context is something we used to do at the Garrison Institute uh, with the various cohorts that were coming through the program is that we would start with an exercise that could be done through journaling or it could be done just through reflection and say it's journaling. In the first column, we ask people to write down some of the greater sources of stress at work. And that was interesting often because in addition to like the obvious issue they were grappling with, sometimes it was things like bad communication with a team or with a supervisor and things they might want to address. And then in the next column, we said, Write down what you do, what you have done to lift your spirits, to cultivate resilience, to get a break, to get some perspective. And then in the, the third, the last column, look back at what you just wrote down and see if you have any comments about it. And it was so interesting because I think for four years, every single person wrote down, listen to music of some kind, although different kinds of music. And People, some people had strong faith, tradition, connection. Some people did not. Sometimes people talked about getting out in nature. Sometimes they talked about things like drinking a lot. I drink a lot. And then in the assessment, this, this actually happened once. It wasn't with domestic violence workers. It was another group I was working with. 
somebody had written down, I get out in nature, and that really helps me. And then they wrote down, of course, I haven't done it in like seven years. That is a true story, you know? And so then you think, well, maybe I should get on it again, you know? Like, and I know we live in a constrained time. It's hard to always access the things that have helped us in the past, but maybe we can or in some other form. And then, you know, people did write down things like I drink a lot. And then they'd look at that and they think, I am worried about that. You know, I, I think I need to both address that and maybe be open to learning new skills. And then, of course, we were opening the door to introducing as an experiment the mindful movement practices and, and the meditation. Sharon. This has been such a pleasure. I'm so happy that we got a chance to talk. Yeah, thank you. That's all for this episode of Road to Resilience. If you enjoyed it, please go to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star rating, a nice review. It's so important for getting other people to find the podcast. And it is by far the highlight of our week. We go and see a nice review. It's like, it like makes it all worthwhile to know that somebody out there is benefiting from this work that we do. Um, another way to help out, and this is huge, is to take our listener survey. It's at mountsinai.org slash RTR survey. You can tell us what's good, what's bad, what's not so great. Um, we want to make the podcast really useful to you. So we want to do the topics that you care about in a way that works for you. So we can only do that if we hear from you. www.mountsinai.org slash RTR survey takes a few minutes to fill out. We appreciate it so much. Road to Resilience is a production of the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. It's made by Nikki Cheatham, me, John Earl, and our executive producer, Lucy Lee. From all of us here, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.